Hello, my fellow dorks. So today we're going to take a look at a very significant piece of music tech history, the Roland MC8 from 1977, the very first of the micro composers. Now, I've already been over the history of this unit thrice times, once in my Roland documentary, once in the preamble for my video about the MC4, and once in written form. This was one of the sections of Inspire the Music that I was privileged to contribute to. So instead, what I thought I'd do is focus in on a band that made significant use of the MC8, which is Yellow Magic Orchestra. Now, Yellow Magic Orchestra's connection to the MC8 comes via their longtime collaborator, Hideki Matsutaki. Now, Matsutaki was an assistant for Tamita, but he also knew Ikataro Kakahashi of Roland and was aware that the MC8 was in development. And in an interview, he says that he bought one the day that it came out, which was not a small thing because these cost the equivalent of about 20 grand in today's money. However, being a skilled synthesis and someone with a digital sequencer who knew how to use it, made him a potent offering for recording artists, including Haruomi Hosono, who brought him in to work on his album Cochin Moon, and Ryoichi Sakamoto, who brought him in to work on his debut solo album on Thousand Knives. And of course, those two gentlemen, along with Yukihiro Takahashi, founded Yellow Magic Orchestra. And guess who they hired to work on their debut album in 1978? Amatsutaki wound up working for them for years and he became part of their live band as well, where he would take two MC8s out on stage and be loading data into one whilst the other one was playing back the current song live on stage, which must have been terrifying. In fact, he jokes in an interview that he had a continual knot in his stomach during this period due to the stress. And a little bit of YMO trivia on the back of their album BMG is a copy of one of their customs declarations from their tours, and you can see the two MC8s listed. So the MC8 became an integral part of both their studio and live sound, and then they later migrated onto the MC4. So what I thought I would do is compose a piece of music in the style of Yellow Magic Orchestra and use the MC8 to do all of the sequencing so we can understand the kind of things that they must have done. So the easiest place to start is with the interface section. So you've got eight CVs and eight gates. So in the most basic scenario, you could have eight monophonic synthesizers or synthesizer voices being sequenced at the same time, which on its own was absolutely incredible for the time. But it gets way more sophisticated than that because these CVs are freely assignable to the gate channels. So you could have CV1 doing the pitch of an oscillator, CV2 doing the filter cutoff, CV3 doing the amplitude, and those could all be connected to gate channel 1. Then 4 and 5 could control the parameters of a voice that are connected to gate 2 then 6, 7, 8 to gate 3. So you can mix and match. So it's pretty sophisticated. You've then got this din out section. So these relate to Roland's proprietary synthesizers of the time system 700 initially, then system 100M. So din A takes CV1 and gate 1 and nothing else. And then din B is configurable. You can give it any CV at any gate and they fire out straight into your cabs. You can also bring in CV and gate from uh, an external keyboard or synthesizer and you can play into the device and record what you're playing, although it's quite clunky and you wind up having to correct it anyway, so it's kind of semi-useful. We've then got multiplexes, six here and another here, which is special. So what these are is on a per step basis and actually assignable to any channel, you can give them one of two values, zero or one, they default to a zero. If you give it a zero, it, it outputs nothing. If it has a one, it outputs a gate high. Why would you want to do that? Well, you can do all manner of things with that. You can switch signal gates, you could step through a step sequencer, you could reset an LFO, you could uh, gate an envelope generator, you could fire off the voices of a drum synthesizer, you could send a pulse train to a drum machine, and in fact, those last two are exactly what the band Landscape did with their MC8. The final MPX relates to this Portamento controller for CV1 only. So if you've got it set to manual, this is the amount of Portamento you'll have, but it will be on every single step. If you put it to multiplex, then there will be no Portamento until you give MPX7 a one value, and then on that step, it will switch over to this amount of Portamento, and that idea was carried on to the System 100M165 module. And then, of course, to this guy. This is the precursor to the TB303 sequencer where you can say, 
I want a slide on this given step. So for future generations who won't know how good they've got it, this is how they programmed an MC8 in the 1970s. You turn it on, there's nothing there like a human being on a Monday morning. First thing you have to do is press this button in the bottom left, time base, and you have to tell it how many clock pulses equates to one quarter note or one crotchet in musical terms. So that is uh, pulses per quarter note. So I'm going to say 120 pulses per quarter note, please, Jeff. Then we need to give it a tempo. So we press the tempo button. I'm going to choose 145. Uh, enter. You can choose a uh, reprogram that later. You can also program tempo changes and you can manually adjust the tempo with this knob if you've got it slightly wrong as well. So we now need to go over to the CV button and this little light comes up and says CV and you say which CV? I say one please Hillary and it says okay which gate do you want to assign CV1 to and I say one please and now we're ready to input data. So each note has a number, numeric number, so if depending on your tuning and which octave your oscillator's in, say C was 24, then C sharp would be 25, D would be 26, and conversely, if C was 24, B would be 23, B flat would be 22, etc. So let's input uh, the notes first. So uh, 12, and you hear it far off. 12, 10, 12. Oh, I've put in 120. That's good, because we'll I'll show you how you fix that. And then 15... Uh, and that's the last note of this bar, so we press measure end. Now, here's something. Look at that, I put a silly value in there, it's wrong. And this is one of the amazing revolutionary things about this unit. You can correct your mistakes. So we go to the step prior to this, and I was supposed to put in 12, put in 12, and I fixed it. So step back, look at this. We can step back, step forward, and that's there's nothing there, so it flashes at you. And it always does this if you've done something wrong. So back to the previous step, we've got our measure end, we're about to put our next bar in, and our notes are 15, 12, 10, 12, 15, 12, 10, 12 is the end of this measure. Then the next one is 8, 8, 8, 10, 12, 7, that's the end of this measure, and then 7, Actually, you don't need to keep inputting seven if you're using the same note. Two, three, five, seven, ten, and then that's the end of that one. So that is four bars. Uh, and what we'll do now is we'll go measure set, go back to zero. And now let's put in the step times. So press step time and it says which channel? One, please, Susan. So uh, we've now got to put in those notes were occurring in a space in time, what was that space in time? So this relates to the time base, so 120 is a crotchet, uh, so 60 would be a quaver, uh, etc. So uh, going back, our first one was 120. Next one's 120, so we don't have to put it in again, we can just press enter, 60, 120, 60. And then we're into the next bar, and these are all 60s, Three, five, six, seven, eight. Then the next bar, 120, another 120, six, and then four 160s. Oop, not 160, 60, I meant. Uh, and then into the next bar, 60, 120, 120, 60, 60, 60. I think that's right. Measure set back to the start. We'll soon find out if it's not right. Now we've got to put in something else, the gate time. So gate time uh, and channel one again. So this is, in within those steps, how long does the event uh, last? Is it the entire step and you can actually even tie it into the next step? Or is it half of it? Or is it none of it? In which case you'd get a rest. And if you're doing a rest, you would still program the CV because otherwise you get this weird thing that as the note from prior goes into the rest, you get a funny like pitch bend. So you still have to program a note that relates to the previous note when you're doing uh, rests. <laughs> so it, it, there's nowhere to hide on this machine. So um, we're, we're back to the start. So I put in my steps, um, my gates, sorry, not my steps. And those are 60, 60, 50, 60, 50, zero. That's a rest. Uh, and then these are all 50s. And then we've got some couple of 60s couple of 
a few 50s, a zero. Uh, I, oh, I've put that wrong. I'll fix that in a second. A 60, a 50. Let's go back and uh, fix that one I did wrong, which was that one. There we go. Measure set, back to the start. And in theory, this should play. Hey. Wow. <laughs> All that work for four bars of music. Something else significant I want to show you. Let's say we wanted to work on the sounds for the first four bars of the first chorus on their own. Well, we could say repeat bar 34, enter two bar 37. So that's bars 34, five, six, and seven, four bars. Press start and put it in cycle. 35, 36, 37, it'll loop. You can hear there's a little jolt where it has to think about it. <laughs> Such was, you know, how primitive the technology was at the time. It couldn't even loop smoothly. But that must have been amazing, you know, at the time to be able to say, can we just jump, not wait for the tape to run through? Can we just jump to a certain bar and then define an endpoint and just work around, have that looping around while I work on a sound? Because this is the great great grandparent of the transport section of your DAW. That's what it is. Now the unit has volatile memory, so as soon as you turn it off, it forgets everything, but it does have tape memory backup. So what you could do is get to a certain point in your sequence, then dump out that data to tape, then crucially play it back into the machine and verify that it has backed up. And then the next day, a week later, a year later, you could load that data back up and continue working on it and then back up a new version with the extra bits and then continue working on it until you're done or at any point in the future, just load back up your complete sequence ready to go. So now you think, great, that's our baseline. Let's carry on and use the other eight channels on this. Well, unfortunately, they weren't quite there yet unless the piece of music was very short because every single time you input one note, you have to put in a CV, a gate and a step, three values. So across the duration of a four minute song, you churn through thousands of bits of data. So we started with nearly 6,000, check the available memory, and we wiped out more than half just doing the baseline. So what they would do is do one or two parts at a time and just keep overdubbing. So that then begs the question, how do you overdub with this thing? Well, when you record your first part, which would probably be your baseline, for example, you simultaneously record a sync pulse output. When you then want to do your overdub, you've got your new sequence in there and your new sounds, you send that sync pulse back into the machine, put it in sync mode, and it locks perfectly. So one final thing I wanted to show you how to program is multiplex, just so some lunatics got it down for future generations. So we've turned the machine on, we put in a time base, 120, again, tempo, 140, although it doesn't matter because we're going to sync this up externally. Uh, and then we go to multiplex and we need to assign it to a channel. I'm going to assign it to channel one. Uh, and now we can input our data. So what we need to do is you can see it says MPX one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. So on each step, all you do is just type the numbers of the multiplexes you want active on that step. So one, three, four, and six on the first step, you can see they all now have a one. And now if I press enter, that's the first step. Second step, I don't want anything, so I just clear, enter. Uh, third step, I want CV um, multiplexes two and three. There you go, two and three. Enter, and you just go through on each step, you activate the multiplexes. So if one to six are active, they output 15 volts on that step. If they're not active, they output nothing. So that's how you use them to trigger and fire off stuff. And multiplex seven is the special portamento one, so on that step. CV1 will have slew. So let's spin on um, and I'll show you the end result. Okay, so I've put in all the multiplex data and then all you have to do is just go back to the start and then just program the step time data, which I've already shown you. So it just knows how long each of those multiplex events last for. Uh, and so let's hear the result. So with just multiplex data and step time data and one channel, you can get an, an additional six sounds out of this sequencer or 
you know, have six parallel modulation lanes. So it's not a small little feature. It's really quite a big deal. So I hope that this has demonstrated how incredibly groundbreaking the MC8 was when it first came out and how kind of fundamentally we still do all the same sort of things that this does just 50,000 times faster. So we're going to finish up with the MC8 sequenced track. Uh, I'm going to put that on my Bandcamp if you're interested. If you're on my Patreon, you can download that for free. Uh, if you're on the top tier, you get the stems as well. And I'm also going to include the data from the MC8 just in case that winds up being useful at some point in the future. Uh, huge thank you to everybody who's helped me understand how on earth this thing works. Uh, thank you to my patrons on Patreon and thank you to you for watching.